All right, we're now recording and uh, very happy to have Jared Miller here today. Uh, he's our local expert here on Delmarva on drones, and he's going to be the scouting tool. So very happy to have you here today, Jared. Thanks so much. Anyone that has questions, please use the chat box. I'll help ma manage that, Jared. All right, thanks. All right, everything up there, Shannon, can you see it? Yes, looks good. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about drones as a scouting tool. This is this is going to be a more basic talk. This isn't drones for mapping or creating maps. I'll mention it a little bit, but this is more of an introduction to drones. I uh, think they're useful for ag. I think the easiest thing to do with them to start with is scouting, but sometimes it's hard to know uh, where to start. So as a disclaimer, there will be reference to commercial products because uh, they're things that we have bought, uh, but this is not an endorsement by the University of Delaware. I certainly have my opinions on some of them, but we're not going to have any bias against those not mentioned or not used because the drone market changes pretty quick. In terms of what drones can do, uh, if you've heard the term remote sensing, there's nothing new with them. Uh, aerial photos and crops are nothing new. We've had satellite imagery. We've used uh, airplanes for a long time. This image that you can see here, you can see very clearly in the bottom left-hand image from an airplane, you can follow those soil types that we mapped going across that field by hand, but you can see the same soil types through this image. So imagery has been used in the past for agriculture, it's just now you can have a lot more control yourself. You can actually go out and collect those images a lot cheaper and at, at different scales than were possible before. There are some terms that you will hear used uh, more in, in, in academia and possibly by the government. I don't use these terms very much anymore because drones has become a more common term. Ten years ago, when drones were more associated possibly with military activities, People wanted to call them UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, and, and then there's the term UAS, which means unmanned aerial systems. So the UAV is the plane or the copter itself. And the UAS includes all the communication hardware, the photography equipment, or the software controls. If you go to any regulatory website, if you go to the FAA, you're going to see UAS. You'll hear uh, university publications, they might say UAV, but since the public is very familiar now with what a drone is, that it can be used in real estate and it can be used in agriculture, I think drone is a perfectly fine term to use. The FAA website is where you're going to want to go to keep up with all the regulations. Everything I say becomes outdated pretty quickly. They do have an unmanned aircraft systems web page and that's where you can find how to become a drone pilot if you if you want to have a pilot certificate and keep up with any of the regulations which do change uh, every year so far for us. I'll get the regulations out of the way at the very beginning because I used to leave this at the end but they change and they're not as interesting as actually flying the drone. There are regulations mostly to keep airspace safe for manned aircraft. We're supposed to we're basically learning how to stay out of the way and how aircraft works. If you are flying this for fun and not your business, uh, the regulations are not quite as steep. You have to stay away from airports and register your drone. That's the simplest way to put it. Again, you want to go to the website to check if there's any changes or um, how they discuss it now. When you are scouting crops, that is a commercial operation. So if you're scouting for your farm, so technically you are a business and you would need a remote pilot license, which I have working for the university. And that is taking a test. It costs about $150. You study for it. After you've studied for it, you realize that basically what the FAA is trying to teach you is to be safe. They're trying to teach you where you can fly, how to avoid aircraft, and what the regulations would be. The basic regulations right now, if you get this commercial um, drone pilot's license, is flying in Class G airspace, which is most airspace that's not near an airport, staying under 400 feet, and uh, flying during the day. Those are some of the basic regulations that you'd have to follow if you're a drone pilot. The benefit of having the pilot's license is it does allow you to get a little closer to some spots. You, you have a little more freedom because you've taken that test and, and, and learned some safety to get a little closer than, say, a, a hobbyist would. But these rules change, and I've seen some updates and rules recently where they might want to track drones within certain airspaces. So 
you want to keep up with all this uh, on my website, my Weebly website, I do put up test resources, how to study for it. It's really not too hard. If you're scared about taking the test, what I did is I just finally signed up for it to make myself study. If you keep putting it off, you'll never do it. Again, if, if you're flying for fun, it's not a big deal. You shouldn't let this part scare you uh, from staying away from using a drone. The drone consumer market can be split into a couple types, very simple. The consumer or prosumer market is going to be probably what you're going to purchase. You can find them at Best Buy. You can find them on Amazon. You can find them in Sam's Club. And these are affordable. There's a range in their quality. Some are a lot easier to use than others. And they have pretty standard configurations. And you're lucky if you're starting now because five years ago it was difficult to find drones like these that were standardized, that were easy to use, and that were affordable. You had to put together a lot of parts when we started in this. There are also the professional, commercial, or industrial drones, depending on what company you're looking at. They label them differently. These are for higher end uses, uh, engineering, surveying, and certainly for us in agricultural research, we have some more expensive drones, but the consumer drones work pretty well as, as well for some of the work we do. And with these, you can add on different accessories. There's also build your own. You can find websites, you can buy parts, and you can build your own drone. If you're trying to do it for a business, you have to prove that it is uh, flight worthy. And if you buy one of the consumer ones, they've already done that testing for you. There are two types that we can discuss. Well, three, technically, but the, the third one is a combination of the first two. There is what they call the rotary, which is similar to a helicopter. They, they typically do not have one rotor, though. The more rotors they have, that's how they name them. So the one you're probably going to buy or have already bought is a quadcopter because it has four rotors or four propellers. The nice thing about these is they, they're great for smaller fields and scouting. These are the ones you should absolutely use for scouting versus the, the other options. They can hover in place over plots. They can sit still. They can turn on a dime. They're much easier to use and get started in. But there is another option, and that's the fixed wing, which we have also used in research. They're obviously similar to an airplane. They only have one propeller, so the benefit of a fixed wing is instead of having four propellers, which are draining the battery, you have one propeller and you're using lift and drag to stay in the air. So it results in a longer battery life. So if I want to map 90 acres, this is a better drone to have. But if you're trying to scout a field, and these can go up to 70 miles an hour, and I think I've probably flown them at 30 or 40, the faster they go, it's very difficult to see anything in the field. You can't hover in a spot. You can't take pictures very easily. They're fun to fly. They're great for gathering videos, but they're much better for more advanced uses, like mapping an entire field versus just trying to capture pictures of a field. So I definitely would never recommend buying one. Most of the time, they're kind of expensive, so you probably wouldn't anyway. But just in case someone tries to sell you one, I would stay away from a fixed wing if you're doing scouting. There is hybrids where people are trying to mix the rotary with the fixed wing. So this one will take off like a helicopter and then fly like a plane. But again, if your goal is to scout a field, this is not going to be very useful. If your goal is to map a field, you might want to buy something like this. But that's the next step. There are several camera types. Some of you will hear about and you will never buy. So I've split them into affordable, expensive, and very expensive, currently very expensive. The affordable ones are going to be regular cameras. Uh, what we call visual camera or RGB, red, green, blue. Most of those prosumers come with this. In the past, we would have to, if we were putting together a drone, we might have to add one. So people would take a, a, Canon, a Canon camera and maybe change the configuration on it, and they would mount that on a drone. But now you can buy one attached. Thermal cameras can be expensive, but they can also be fairly cheap. Some of the versions are cheap, and you can, you can attach these to some drones. There's only one consumer drone I know of right now that comes with a thermal camera, and it costs uh, $1,700 to $1,900, so it's still expensive. Then there's the multispectral. This, gives you, uh, this will give you different options that are more advanced, that are more for precision agriculture, in my opinion, than just scouting. Although they could give you some nice maps for scouting, you can get perfectly adequate images from a visual camera. And then there's LiDAR, which helps us detect elevation and height, and hyperspectral, which is 
a very advanced, expensive camera that will be much better off for research than in your hands. And some of the cheapest ones I found are $20,000, so I don't think that's one you're going to buy. So we'll focus on the ones that you'll be used to and that you'll use. The visual cameras are the most likely ones you'll use for scouting, and they work great. You can add a camera to a drone, which is usually done with higher-end cameras and would have been done five years ago. A lot of times you'd buy a drone and have to purchase a separate camera. But all of the versions that you have now that I'd recommend that you buy are going to come with a camera on there already. So all the prosumer models are going to come with a camera attached to it. I do recommend that you learn some basic photography skills because the better drone you buy and the better software it has, it's going to give you options that maybe you haven't fooled around with in the camera before, such as shutter speed, your aperture, ISO, or white balance. You can go with the automatic functions. But you can also make adjustments. Sometimes you can actually be up in the air and make some of these adjustments and make a photo better than it appears with the automatic mode. Automatic works perfectly fine, but it's simple to learn some of these things. You can watch some YouTube videos. There's plenty of photographers that will teach you how to do some of this. Some very basic things to think about are don't face the sun. If you haven't thought about that before, if you turn away from the sun when taking a picture, everything looks a lot nicer. So if you're trying to get an image of the field and you see the picture on the left, then fly down to the other end of the field and turn around and look back. And Sometimes you'll get a much better shot. Clouds actually do matter. One thing they will tell you about drones is we don't have to worry about clouds. Now, if you're scouting, it's not such a big deal. If you're mapping, it becomes a very big deal. Clouds do definitely interrupt satellite photography. And because we can fly below clouds, people say they don't mess with drones. But if you're trying to do mapping or you have shadows go across your fields, it is a little more difficult to see things. So cloudy days do actually mess with us with drone photography. The multispectral camera, which I'm going to mention because this is some of the work that we do, and maybe you will be interested in purchasing one, and I definitely would not recommend it unless you're going to do some kind of advanced mapping. But it's very similar to the visual camera, except you have multiple lenses, and each one of those lenses has a filter, and it focuses on a certain band or region in, in, of light. So uh, these cameras can include visual bands like red, green, and blue, and then they might have a near infrared or a red band um, or red edge. And they are important for doing what we call these vegetation indexes, like NDVI. So sometimes if you're looking into some of this information on drones, you're going to see the term NDVI, which is just a way for us to try and measure different aspects of plants on the ground. It's not necessarily something you need for scouting. So a multispectral camera, instead of having one lens that captures an entire range of light, it's going to have these filters that only capture blue, red, or near infrared. And then with that, we can do a calculation called NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. It takes the near infrared light, subtracts red light from it, and then divides it by near infrared plus red. Because a healthy plant is going to reflect more near infrared, a stressed plant they're going to be a little more even, and dead plants are right about even in the reflection. So we can actually tell the difference between healthy and distressed plants. It doesn't mean it tells you what's wrong with the plant. It just tells you something's wrong in the field. So NDVI is a great way to get us the measurement for research. But you don't need it to scout, necessarily. Does it help? Does it make a nice picture? Yes. But you don't need to purchase a more expensive camera to see what's going on out in the field. And here's a great example from some of our research plots. On the left, you have one shot, which is just a visual camera. And you can see we have some nitrogen trials. And those lighter green areas in the yellow box are lower nitrogen rates. And the darker green in the blue box are higher nitrogen rates. Does it pop more in the NDVI image? Yes. Does it give me a value I can use in my research project? Yes. It's definitely something that's useful when we're doing research. But you don't need it to see a difference in the field. You can certainly see what's going on and then walk out there and take a sample. So multispectral cameras, great for research, but a visual camera works perfectly well and can discern a lot of different things out there. So you can add cameras, and you can buy a prosumer model like the ones on the right, and you can add a multispectral camera to some of them because they want to sell these cameras, but I don't think you need to. The more advanced drones are going to allow you to add different cameras. Uh, the one we have on the left there can actually hold two different cameras, so we can add a thermal to it. We could add another visual to it. But these are more for research. They're more expensive drones and more expensive cameras. 
The drones you'll probably buy on the right, the camera comes pre-attached and can't be changed, which is fine. Most of these cameras are pretty high quality and they take some nice photos. Some other parts of the drone you might hear about would include a gimbal. So again, five years ago when we were buying some drones, we might have stiff mounted cameras if they didn't come with a gimbal, which means whenever you fly, that camera is locked in place and that's all you can see. The nice thing about a gimbal is it will do two things for you. If you're trying to record video, that gimbal will keep the camera steady and level. Unless it's not working right, which can happen sometimes, there's a little software glitch. But as you're flying along, if you're trying to record a video to show somebody and, and people comment on how steady your video is, it's because that gimbal helps you out with that. The other thing the gimbal does is allow you to move the camera up and down. So you can look straight across the field or you can look straight down. In this case, that the, the fourth picture all the way on the right is that camera looking straight down from the drone. I've just flipped it upside down. But that way, you can, you can have different angles when you're looking across the field. So most of those prosumer models are going to come with a gimbal. And they might say two axis or three axis. And three axis are considered to be more stable and much better for video, but two axis work perfect. So gimbals are going to be standard if you spend money on a nicer drone. The next question is, and once you picked your drone and you know what camera you have, and more than likely you have that visual camera, you have to think about how you're going to fly it. And these things are very, very easy to fly. These companies want to be able to sell drones to us, so they're going to make them easy to fly, especially if you're from a generation that grew up with video games, because you'll notice that these controllers are very similar to a lot of the video game controllers that we grew up with. So you're going to have these two joysticks on the left and the right. You have a bunch of buttons, some of which you will never use, depending on which one you buy. These buttons might allow you to pause it. They might allow you to make it take off. But they're pretty easy to use once you get used to and you fly a couple times. Of course, when we're scouting, there becomes a difference that you want it to connect to some type of screen. Because if you're going to fly across a field, you want to be able to look at something. If all you get is a remote that does not connect to a phone on the left or some kind of tablet, then all you have is a drone for flying for fun and not for scouting your fields. So you want this thing to be able to connect to a phone. Most of the ones that are sold now will probably do that. But before you purchase something, if you decide to go cheaper, you're going to want to read all the specs and make sure that it will connect to your phone. So the great thing, like this one on the right, you can see that the phone uh, fits right into that slot, and you can hold it there and look. But you can also you can also hook these up to tablets. And one thing I'll recommend about a tablet is it's a lot easier to see your fields. And if you have ever get into mapping and drawing automatic flight plans, it's a lot easier to draw those out in the field as well. I have used an iPod when I had to because that's all I had. I prefer to use a tablet. The problem with a tablet is if you're out in the field and it has no internet service, you can't always tell, especially if you're doing, you can see that map on the left, that aerial photo. It might not bring up an aerial photo and you don't know exactly where you're standing. It's not a big deal if you're just flying a field and scouting. It becomes a bigger deal if you get into mapping. Your phone is the best thing to use because it will download the app you need to fly the plane, in most cases the drone. It will have internet all the time and it will connect to most of these controllers. If you get a tablet, you just have to consider if you're going to go out in the field ahead of time. If you want an aerial photo underneath, sometimes I have to download them ahead of time. But that's typically for more advanced mapping uses. The best thing about a tablet for scouting is just being able to see a large image and not have to zoom in on the phone. Some of these tablets uh, will probably need GPS because they'll want to know where you're standing. Some of the there are Samsung tablets that come with GPS, and if you're going to use an iPad, you have to make sure it has cell service before you do that. And another thing you want to consider is, does the drone you're buying work with both Android and Apple software? Some of them do not. Again, if you spend the money, if you spend more money, they probably do, but I have bought one in the past that only worked on Apple. So you want to be careful with that. When you're going to use the controller, uh, this 3DR here is from a company that does not make drones anymore, but it is an easy controller to look at. You're going to have two joysticks on most of these. They will either do up and down for flying, they will rotate it, they will go forward and backward, and they'll go left to right. You can set this yourself, or you can go with the standard configuration. You just take it up, you use it, you never be scared the first time you do it, and you figure out how it works. 
And if you are flying slow enough and something goes wrong, you can remember which joystick does what. But you just need practice most of the time. So the first time might be a little scary, but the second or third time you get used to it. They can have a takeoff button on there. Some of these have a takeoff button that allow it to take off. A lot of times you'll control it through the app. The uh, DJIs will actually, through the joysticks, you can, you can set it up to take off. And you just have to know, based on the drone and the manual, you get how to do that. Everyone's going to be just a little bit different. A lot of them do have a pause button. The pause is going to be more for automatic flights. If you have it on an automatic flight plane where you're not controlling, you hit pause, it should stop. If you are flying a rotary drone by hand and you take your hands off the joystick, it stops. And then there is the return to home button. These are important. You want your drone to have this because if something goes on wrong, if it has a return to home button, that already means that if the battery is going low or it loses signal, it will come back to the place it took off. If your GPS was working when you took off, which is something else you want to consider before you fly that drone up, make sure it's connected to GPS and marks where it left. So the return to home can also have a button, and if you're not comfortable with something, you can press the button, or if you don't want to fly it back by hand, you press this button, and it will return to the spot it took off. You can always take over at any time. Anytime you want, you can take over and land it yourself, but it allows you to not have to concentrate on flying it back. But you want to make sure if you hit that return to home button, because it's assuming you know the direction it's going to come back, and it's not going to crash into a tree or somewhere else it shouldn't. You can also do software control. So this is another thing you have to be careful about when buying a drone. Make sure that it's going to come with a remote control. If you see a cheaper version of that same drone, it might mean it doesn't come with a remote, and it will be all be software controls. And it is very hard to fly a drone just by the software. The best thing about the software is how it adds to seeing the image where you're flying, seeing the battery that's left in the drone in your controller, you can see the height. There are buttons on there like that land one up in the middle that you can tell it to land or return to home. You can take photos with this app and you can change flight modes. It depends on what, what type of drone you buy and what it does. And you can also see a little where is my drone that helps you figure out which direction if you've lost sight of it, which you're not supposed to do. You're supposed to keep your eyes on it at all times. But as you'll see, these things can get pretty small, especially as these consumer drones can be hard to track if you're not keeping your eye on them the whole time. So the software is useful, obviously, for seeing the image, but also giving you some additional information and sometimes flying the drone for you. But the easiest way to fly this drone is with the remote itself. So hypothetically, let's say for some reason your drone crashes, comes down out of the sky in the middle of a cornfield. There are a lot of options on these, like that return to home button, that until you need them, you might not try it out. And that's the day you'll regret not knowing how it works. So these better drones will also have a GPS tracking in their software that allows you to figure out where that drone's at. You don't want to have the drone, like this one, drop into a cornfield, and then you have to figure out how to use that software. So if there's a return to home button, if there is some kind of find my drone feature, you should practice that right after you buy it. You should set it up over somewhere and use the GPS tracking it has to lead yourself to that drone. So if you're out somewhere and it does come down in a cornfield and it doesn't matter that this stuff's only uh, 12 inches tall, it's still very hard to find the drone, you want to make sure that you know how to use it. So you can do automatic pre-planned flights. It's very easy to do. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it, but once you've got past scouting, you can take this step. You can see what it's better for for me is mapping. It takes photos across that whole field that I can stitch together later into a larger map. You can use it for scouting, and I've tried it, but I think it's a lot better if you do scouting by hand. But you can certainly, if you want to have an automatic flight plan and have it map the field the same way and take pictures the same way every time, or record a video along the same path, you can do that with these softwares. And they usually work with the higher price drones. And by higher price, I'm talking $500 to $2,000 in that range. Those drones are usually, you can find some software that will help you do a pre-planned flight. Flying a rotary versus a fixed wing, this is how I try to differentiate why you should never use a fixed wing for scouting. Or if you're not familiar with drones, you shouldn't get into using one. You can see that rotary on the left, that little circle there where it took off in that middle photo, 
Now it cleared out that dust. It's just hovering in place. I took my hands off the joystick, and it sits there. It doesn't move until you tell it. So if you want it to hover over a spot in the field or you want to stop for a second, this is the best drone for that. It will stop on the edge of your property. That fixed wing on the right, it wants to go out and turn around. It might go somewhere you don't want it to if you're trying to capture the edge of a field. All of these rotaries can stop on a dime, and they can follow the edge of your field, and they can stay away from places you don't want them to go. You can take off in the middle of the road. You can take off in the middle of the soybean field. I have taken off and landed these on the back of the truck because they're small enough and easy to control, and you can land them about anywhere. So they're a lot easier to use. I don't think most people will buy a fixed wing, but sometimes you might run into a salesman that tries to sell one to you. So just in case, never buy this for scouting. You got to keep your eye on the prize. You have to legally keep your eyes on the drone the whole time. But sometimes you might look down and look up, and you can't see it anymore. So in the picture on the left, we have the fixed wing. You can see that that fixed wing has a pretty wide wing base compared to our smaller drones. You should be able to pick it out easy, but it's very difficult to see, especially if you take your eyes off it. And these things are moving quickly. You can lose it. And the smaller your drone is, the further it gets from you, the harder it is to see it which is why the FAA wants us to have most cases a visual observer in our, in our research projects, which is useful to have someone with you that keeps their eyes on it while you're looking around. The thing about scouting, though, is because you have a camera on there that's sending a signal back to your phone and it's looking at a portion of the field, you can usually look at that picture and say, okay, that's where it is, it's over there, and you can find it again. But the higher you fly and the further you are away and the smaller that drone is, you will lose sight of it if you don't watch it the whole time. There's some additional items I tell people to consider. Once you have invested in a drone, you might not want to spend more money, but you should buy more batteries. And there's several reasons for this. One, that quadcopter will drain a battery pretty quick once you start having fun flying around a field. You can run out of battery very fast, and you'll want backups charged and ready to go if you need to get back up there. The other thing is, these drones don't always stick around very long. If you plan on having this for five years, there's a, there's a good chance that they'll quit making that drone or batteries for it, so you want to have some backups. Another thing I learned and I recommend is you can see I put numbers on my drones because these drones, these batteries themselves, some of them might not be as good as those. They'll end up wearing out a little bit quicker, and you'll want to know which one that is. I need to know if number three was a bad battery, so I either get rid of it or I only use it when I have short flights. You want to check the weather in most cases. Uh, if you have to go an hour away to a field and you get there and the winds are 22 miles an hour, you're, you're not necessarily going to feel comfortable about taking that drone up. So check the weather before you go. If you're like us in research and we have to go to fields that might be an hour away and you get there and can't fly it, you ended up wasting some time. So check for rain, wind, and clouds. See what weather's coming. So if you're going to fly, that you feel comfortable doing it. And one of our biggest things that we have to do in agriculture is obviously watch for crop dusters. You don't see many planes flying below 400 feet. But these guys can pop up over a tree, and you have to stay out of the way. So be listening. On a windy day, it's hard to hear them. If you're familiar, if it's your fields and you know they're coming, that's fine. But if you're like us in research and you can go around a little bit, you might end up in an area and find one pop up over the tree line. It's very easy to stay out of their way with a rotary. It's very difficult to stay out of the way with a fixed wing. So why even buy a drone, and how would it even help you? Because if, if you've gotten scared due to the regulations or some of the cost of these, what's the benefit? How does it even help? You can certainly walk and scout your fields and see a lot. With a drone, you can find some things, and you get a different perspective, and you can find some things faster. So the picture, the first picture there all the way on the left, we have some research trials. And down this center, part of this picture, you can see where these trials, this one strip, didn't get hit, side dress with nitrogen. And just because I had the drone out that day and we caught it in time, we were able to get back out there and add more nitrogen to that corn crop. You can also fly out and scout for weeds without walking. Now, you can certainly see weeds popping up over soybeans in most cases. But the nice thing about a drone is getting out there and seeing, is it, a, is, it, is it a larger amount of weeds? What type of weed is it? You can fly down there and hover over top and get some shots. If it's the corner of the field that's hard to get to, you can get out there quickly and decide, do I need to do something about this or leave it alone, especially when you get canopy coverage. And then one of the, the more important things for me as a scientist is finding the soil variability prior to yield. 
So we had some research projects here, but with the drone, what we couldn't see on the ground that we could see from the air was we have a lot of variability in this field that has nothing to do with our project. And this variability is going to mess with the results that we get. And now we can be aware that maybe we need to set up our trials a little differently in this field. And you can do the same thing with your fields. You might be able to pick out areas that you can take soil samples from. If you want to follow things as they happen through the years, so here we have some application issues where some biosolids weren't applied evenly across one part of the field. And the question is, can you follow this through the season? So you've got some th pretty thin strips. It'd be hard to see. You can walk through this cornfield. That picture on the right, you can walk through this cornfield, and you can tell there's a problem, but you can't tell, tell where it's at. But when you look at the drone photo, that pattern, that application pattern is obvious, and you can see it very clearly. It doesn't mean you can do anything about it, but it lets you know if this field had lower yields than normal, what might have happened. And it gives a good example to people of why we should calibrate all of our equipment before application. The extent of problems are a lot clearer from the air. So we have, this is a picture from the ground and then a picture from the air of a disease in soybeans. So the drone can see this problem. It can show you where it's at. And in this case, it's actually following landscape position. The upland beans are a little better than the lowland beans. But you can see the extent of the problem. It doesn't mean you can do anything about it in all cases, but it can let you know what's going on in your field, maybe what to expect in the future. Maybe um, you plant different uh, resistant beans, depending on what the disease is in this region. But it, it helps you see the extent of the problem. The issue is with drones is sometimes you hear in the media that drones can detect disease. In this case, all the drone told you was there's something wrong. You then have to walk the field and collect a sample like we did and give it to a pathologist for them to tell you what the problem is. Drones can see a problem. They do not know what the problem is. It takes a trained eye or a trained agronomist to actually determine the problem. To me, this is the, the best part about a drone, particularly in research, is instead of waiting for yield, so a lot of times we'll put out our treatments and then we wait for yield and maybe we spotted something, maybe we didn't. But the nice thing about a drone is if you take that thing up every week, you can follow problems as they develop. So we actually can see how quickly these beans went down from sudden death syndrome as it popped up in late August and knocked them down by September 10th. So we didn't have to wait until harvest. And for a larger field where you don't have field trials, it's the same thing. If you have a low spot in the field, if you want to know was it drought that did it in, was it deer damage, if you're following it with a drone, when you can't walk it, you can actually start to determine what happened in this field and is it something I can fix or is it something I have to deal with. Another thing is if you're going to separate out and do different samples across your field, a yield map can certainly tell you a lot of this, but again, what we see in some of these pictures because we were going out often enough is when a drought came through, you can see the differences in the soil types that might not be apparent. They should show up in your yield map, but they might not. And so now you can decide, well, if I have different soil types across here, should I sample these different? Or does this explain why we have different results? So the picture on the right would be some of our variety trials. And now we can see that there is a low spot in that field that held more moisture when we, when we had drier conditions. So that explains why some of the yields might be higher in that region. It didn't have anything to do with varieties as much as it did with soil type. So it helps you find these, these patterns that is very difficult to find from walking across the ground. So the, the next question is, well, when can you scout? And of course, how high can you fly and still see something? So you can fly legally up to 400 feet if you have your drone pilot's license. But do you want to fly 400 feet? So we, we did a project with the Delaware Soybean Board where we scouted some fields through the season. A lot of this is going to be common sense, but you still have to do it to know. You have to actually go out and try. Otherwise, you have no reason to plan out work like this. So we went up and scouted these fields, and it's very obvious, because there are beans in that field on the left, that early in the season, when you don't have canopy, it's hard to see any patterns at all outside of soil patterns. You can't really detect any weed differences. You can't really see what was going on with the beans. Walking that field was just as good as flying really low with a drone, and the lower that drone is, when it goes fast, all of these images can become a blur, because a lot of times they're being sent across Wi-Fi as well. So walking that field using a four-wheeler was certainly uh, just as good or better than using a drone the early in the season you went. But both beans and corn, or any crop, and certainly if you had pasture, once you have canopy, 
Then you're looking at the plant effects and how they're related to soils or anything else that's going on in that field. So once we get out later in the season and our beans had full canopy, then you start to see these patterns. So this one here, where you're seeing this difference, is actually the edge of where the irrigation hits. So it's a great image to show people why you need to invest in irrigation on a sandy soil. You can see deer paths cutting from those woods across this field. You can see a little patch of weeds right below this irrigation track in here that tells you maybe it's an area that needs to be watched next year. Once you have full canopy, you can detect soil types, you can detect diseases if they're large enough, or any kind of problem that's a pattern across the field. It's still hard to see things on a small scale. So this one drone image, you can see a little bit of mare's tail popping up out of it. And it's, if you fly low enough and you feel comfortable, you can get a picture as good as your cell phone walking across this field. So the great thing about a drone later in the season is picking out patterns when you have full canopy when you can actually see something, and it has to be something that's large enough that your eye can catch it. You still see a lot more when you walk across the field than when you use the drone, but sometimes when you're later in the season with soybeans, even when you walk irrigation tracks, it is a pain to get across that field. So in terms of efficiency of scouting methods, we did an automatic flight to take photos for this project. We did a manual flight where we just flew where we wanted and took pictures, and then we walked the fields. So the automatic flight was the same thing every time. It flew at 200 feet, it collected pictures, and I'd come back to my office and look at them. So the automatic flight is great. Say you're a consultant and you hire someone to work under you, you can send them to those fields, have a plan, and they fly it every time, and they bring it to you, and you look at the pictures. You still would have to return. If there was a problem you need to ID it, you might still have to go back to that field and look at it. Manual flight in place, you go where you want, you fly at the height you want, you get as close as you want, and you stop. It's not consistent, but it obviously uses a lot less photos, only 18 versus 44 photos, and the storage size of that is 136 versus 350 megabytes. You can still ID about as many issues because from the air it is still difficult to catch everything unless there's a large pattern. Walking takes a lot more time, 25 minutes on average. It takes less photos, but it finds more issues, not necessarily uh, economic threshold issues, in that case, seven to eight means I identified an insect. It doesn't mean it was enough to cause a problem, but it's a lot easier to see insects and single weeds from walking a field. It comes back to time management. What can you do with your time? With a drone flight, you can get up in the air and see a pattern quickly. You can drop down and see what's going on, and then still you might have to walk out there, but you know where that problem is. Usually my re recommendation with a manual flight is since you can go 400 feet, you get to that field, you shoot that thing straight up to 400 feet, and you get a shot across that field and see if you see any patterns, and then you fly to them. If you fly low to start with, you don't catch those large patterns that are, that are going to really draw you into what the problem might be. So there is another question about can we use satellites? Well, yes, we're getting satellite imagery in. One of the problems with satellite imagery is if they're clouds, you don't get as many we're getting um, better quality satellite imagery. You have to look at what spatial resolution you're getting. In this case, you can see our research plots on the left. If we were to get some of the free 30 meter resolution satellite imagery, one pixel would be that green box that says 30 meters. It wouldn't give me enough information. Now you have a very large field, maybe it's enough. So the better the resolution is when you go down to five or one and a half, cent, um, one and a half meters, the resolution is good enough that you can start to catch these patterns. And when we've compared them to some of our drone photos, they can be pretty similar. But it really helps if you have a larger field, such as in this case here. You can see on the right, we have a drone photo where we were doing some burn down trials with cover crops. You can see those strips where we burned down cover crops. This May 3rd, satellite image from the sky, picks up those same strips. It's not clear, but you can see patterns across that field. So if you're getting satellite imagery in and you have large fields, and you might have larger variability in soil types, you can see what's going on and you could still say, well, I need to walk to this part of the field and see why is it greener, why is it, why is it paler, what's going on in this case. Cloud cover can limit the number of images you get from satellites and that's where the drone helps. But neither the drone nor the satellite matter if you don't act on the information. If you see different soil types and never sample them, if you see a disease and never sample for it, if you don't go out and spray for the weeds, then doing all this was just for fun and it wasn't anything additional uh, to help you out with production ag. The next thing you might want to do 
after you get used to scouting, you get comfortable with the drone and you can get comfortable very fast, is you might want to try some of the field mapping because it is hard to get the whole field in one photo. So you can see our research trials there on the left, with that cloud cover coming across. We have several different trials across this field. I can fly down and get images. I might have to take several to get a shot. But you can also set up an automatic flight, point that camera straight down. You can collect a whole bunch of images and then have software stitch it together. It costs more money and it takes more time. But you can see on the right that instead of having that one image from a distance, I can have a stitched image where you can zoom into different parts and see more patterns across the field. And it's very apparent when you look at Uh, Jared, uh, I think you cut out. Can you hear me? When did I cut out? Um, you were explaining. No, I, I think it was the next slide. Okay, this one. Yes, that one. Yeah. Right yeah. Yep. Yep. I have this mute button is is right near where I'm pushing <laughs> to the keyboard. You were um, it, you didn't go very far, so you okay. should be good to go. All right, so you can see this picture on the left. It's our irrigation research farm. That picture tells you plenty. You can fly down to any of those spots and take a look at what's going on. You can circle very quickly with that drone and get a shot of this whole field in seconds. It does not take long to do. But you can see if you want to show someone one image of a field and find patterns that are obvious, pointing that camera straight down, taking a lot of photos, and then having software stitched together, you get a whole field image. And this is better for larger fields. Obviously, our plot trials, I can show you one image. So for these, you can have a nice image. However, satellites can also get you this just as quickly. If you have um, good resolution, you can see the same thing with a satellite photo. But then the next question is, do you really need to map this field and have a larger map? For us in research, yes, it's helpful. For someone else, production ag, it might be a question of cost and time. So the interesting things for us would be, can we take all this other information we have, electrical connectivity and soils and yield and elevation that we might already be using to create zones for soil sampling, can you take a drone map that's been taken once a week, once a month, or a couple times over the season, and incorporate that into this information and give a better idea of what's limiting yield? which would be our interest. And a lot of these maps, they can go right in ArcGIS. And we've also loaded drone maps into uh, Ag Leader, into SMS. So you can do it, but the question is, is it worth your time and is it worth the effort to you? Another thing we've worked on is taking this drone map to look at how good the vegetation looks, in this case it's for wheat, and looking at tiller counts and then using it to create a variable rate application, which is very possible because it'd be similar to something like using GreenSeeker. So if you want more advanced applications, you can do something like this. But the question always comes down to what are you going to use the maps for? The easiest thing to do is buy yourself a cheaper drone, and with your cell phone, you can take pictures, and on the left, you can see all those problems easily. If you get more comfortable, or let's say that you are a consultant or a consulting company, then you might offer this as a service where you map the field, but it takes more expertise, time, and investment to get to that picture on the right. I like them for research, but I'll always tell people on the left, you can see plenty with a cheaper drone and your cell phone. You don't need the more advanced uses. So my current opinions on, on scouting, because this can change with knowledge and the uh, cost of some of the equipment that comes out, the most efficient and economically viable use of drones is scouting. All of the discussion sometimes in the media goes all the way to the end, like we're going to detect an insect and tell you where to spray. We're not there yet. And you don't have to do that yourself. But they overlook how valuable drones are to just seeing an image of your field and learning. Do I need to sample here? Do I need to scout this section? Do I need to correct something or do I have to deal with it? You still have to walk the fields. The drone does not know what's wrong. You have to have the knowledge. So if someone comes on your farm and says, I'll fly your field for you and give you images, but they're not an agronomist, then they can't necessarily help you. But you could spend the money on a drone yourself and do this. So making these maps that I've showed you, they're great for research. I still don't think they're quite ready for precision ag, but we're getting there. 
But those maps are still good for field scouting if you want to have a map of your field over several years at different times. Of course, Google typically, typically puts up something nice on Google Earth that you can see uh, at least once or twice every couple of years. You can see an image of your field and what happened. Satellite maps, I think, have potential to produce some of the variable rate we're looking at if the resolution is high enough. So all this work we're doing with drones might become moot if we can get higher quality satellite imagery and an affordable option. If you're going to buy a drone or a UAV, these are my recommendations. Obviously, I've told you not to buy the fixed wing. They're fun, but I wouldn't buy one. Make sure it's a quadcopter. Make sure it has a camera. Make sure it connects to your phone. This might all sound silly, but if you decide that you're going to buy a $150 drone off of Amazon instead of some of the more expensive name brand ones, you might find that it doesn't have a nice camera or it might not connect to your phone. Make sure it has a good range. This one's very important. They might not tell you, but these things might get, say, a couple hundred feet from you and then lose contact where the better drones can go uh, several hundred feet or more further miles in some cases from you and still have good range and connection. You want to make sure that it has return to home and avoids obstacles. Some of these have uh, near infrared or uh, sensors on them that will help you avoid obstacles. Not perfectly. I have not crashed one, but you don't want to test this out by trying to fly it into a building, but it should help you avoid them. The more you pay, the safer this drone is, the easier it is to handle, and the less likely you will crash it. So all this can cost you anywhere from $700 to $2,000. You can spend $500 on a pretty decent drone that doesn't handle wind very well. You can spend $2,000 on a drone that will handle wind and have a very nice camera. It all depends on what you want to get out of it. So we have different resources that we put up on our extension page. I mainly keep it on my Weebly page because universities like to delete and change things. So I have two fact sheets that consider some of what I talked about, about um, how to pick a drone and how to consider it for field crop production. And we will update if we have better research information on how to use it for mapping or using variable rate application, this is where it would go up. So if you have any additional questions, you can certainly check out my web page or anything we might put up on the agronomy blog. And let me know if you have additional questions. I'm going to have to back out of this so I can see if there's questions. Yep. I don't see anything right now. Um, okay. Just if it's a chance, you know, use the chat pod or the Q&A pod if you have questions for Jared? That was really great. Very good. Really digging into to how they get used because I think there's a lot of discussion about drones, but really the application on them. Yeah, I think the the media gets excited because there'll be a there'll be an article from a university that where they detected a disease and then you'll you'll see it written about. But it's it's not farmer ready in most cases. But mm -hmm. if you have knowledge of your fields and you understand agriculture to a degree, that image of a field can show you a lot very quickly. I'm not seeing anything. Um, Jared, when you send me the email of the slides, um, also the Weebly site would be great to include, I can include on our uh, the page that we post the recording. Okay, no problem. All right, any other questions for Jared? I'm going to go ahead and stop recording at this point. <laughs>